Good morning. A um, little background here real quick. Uh, the first song that we sang, twice, um, that was actually written by the first pastor of Jesus Community Church, uh, Dennis Appleberry's brother, Rex. Dennis, do you have anything you'd like to share about the song? Uh, it's just a wonderful song. I know he, back in those days, all we had for instruments, he, he would play that with his guitar. Guitar, right. <laughs> yeah, I remember seeing pictures of that. Um, so that's awesome. I, I love the fact that we can hand off a legacy. Um, second thing is, um, we sang the song Overwhelmed, and there's a phrase in there that has really come to mean a lot to me. Um, it says, God, I run into your arms unashamed because of mercy. Um, I, I don't know how all of you guys viewed or view your relationship with God, but for the majority of my life, I viewed my relationship as, with God as I, I was the redheaded stepchild. And I stood in the corner, <coughs> and when he needed something, he sent me to do it. And then there were those others, like my wife and some of my children, that, that just... They, they instinctively know the love that God has for them, and they sit on his lap. I wasn't one of those. I was one of the ones that served. I wasn't the lap sitter. I wasn't the snuggler. And over the last number of years, probably going back about six or seven years, God has been reworking my thinking. Okay. Um, Christy, what is the passage? I think it's in Isaiah that talks about him holding us as a lamb to his chest. In, uh, Isaiah 40. 40. Um, there's an awesome picture that God takes the lamb and holds him close to his chest, close to his heart. Now, the other side of this is any of you that have ever actually raised lambs, mm -hmm know that they're really not all that gentle and still when you hold them close to their heart. They're a little bit fractious. They're a little bit feisty. And it takes some doing to get them calmed down so they can... That's kind of us with God. We can be fractious as he's trying to hold us close to his heart. And, and, but when we calm down and we can feel his love, his care, his concern for us. I love the thought, God, I run into your heart. Uh, when my grandchildren come over, hmm. you open the door and you hear, Papa, Manga! And they come rushing to the house. And, and if you're not braced, <laughs> they, will, they just run right into you. <clears throat> and I love that idea that, that God is the same way. That he wants us, when we see him, when we come into his presence, he wants that excitement, that love, that devotion, that adoration as we run into his arms because we know I have spanked every one of my grandchildren, some of them significantly more than others. Um, <clears throat> but all of my grandchildren still know that they're safe in Papa's arms. They're still safe to come running to Papa. As a matter of fact, after they get in trouble, usually one of the first things they do is they kind of edge their way back over to me to make sure everything's okay. And I would encourage you, as a parent, as a grandparent, after you've disciplined the child, make room for that mercy to be shown. Because when they come back to you, you need to pick them back up and reassure them, yeah, I still love you. My love for you did not diminish or change by what you did. What you did was wrong but my love for you remains. So I, I am taken by the idea. I'm unashamed before God. <clears throat> not because I've done so right. Not because of my righteousness. Not because I'm good. But because of His mercy. Mm -hmm. Because His mercy stripped all of that soiled and rotten raiment off. And He bathed me. And He anointed me. And He wrapped me in clothes of white raiment. And he calls me child. So there you have it. Um, if you have your Bibles, we're going to wrap up the Feast of Pentecost, Shavuot, Shavuot. How do you say it, Jeannie? Shavuot. Yep, that's it. Um, we talked a little bit last week. I didn't cover nearly as much as I wanted to. Um, 
I'm not going to hit a lot of the scriptures that talk about Shavuot, the feast in the New Testament. It's called the Feast of Pentecost. Shavuot, it's sevens, correct, Jeannie? Sevens, also translated as weeks, because in Leviticus 23, we see that after the waving of the Omer, the, the first fruits, we talked about that, where they'd bring the barley in, and they would crush it and, and, and make grain out of it and sift it, and then they would present it to the priest, and he would take the, the Omer of the grain, and he'd wave it as a wave offering to God. And then it says, after that, the, the Sabbath after that, you count 49, seven sevens, thus Shavuot, sevens, and then the day after, you celebrate. Okay. Now, if you count that up, and, and the Hebrew, they do seven sevens, and then the 50th day is a given because that's the day you have the feast. But in Western thinking, we call it Pentecost. Pentecost is 50. It's 50 days. We're right direct into the point. Okay? And, and because of our thinking, we miss a lot of the flavor, the depth of Scripture. Um, I'll, I'll address that later. Um, so, we talked about the setting and the establishing of this feast. Uh, there's a number of Old Testament Hebrew Bible scriptures that refer to the feast and how it was to be enacted. Uh, this was the feast at the end of the spring harvest season, um, predominantly wheat, but that didn't mean that was all they brought in because they also brought in figs and pomegranates and uh, grapes, olive oil. Uh, there were seven um, produce items that, that were known for, Israel was known for. And so all of these could be brought in. Barley was already brought in, so these others would be brought. But we're, we're focusing specifically on the wheat because they take it in. There's a huge celebration as they bring the produce into Jerusalem. There would be people singing and music playing as they brought the, their, their offering up to the temple. Um, now, th there's a couple of things. Flip in your Bible to Leviticus 23 because we're going to read that passage again and we need to mark a couple of really significant things. And if you don't understand what's happening, you're going to blink right over them. Okay? So, let's go to um, Leviticus chapter 23. Okay. Okay. We're going to jump down <clears throat> to verse 15. Um, a lot of the Bibles have a little subtitle right above the passage. Mine says, The Feast of Weeks. Does anybody have anything different? Uh, Pentecost. Pentecost, okay. I'm sorry? The Feast of Harvest. The Feast of Harvest, okay. All of those are correct. Uh, last week we went over a number of names that the Hebrew gave to this. Um, Shavuot is, is predominant throughout the scripture until New Testament when it's, when it's called Pentecost by the Greek name for, for 50. Um, so going into uh, verse 15, you shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day you brought the sheep of the wave offering. That's the first fruits. Okay, Right here, we already were one verse into this thing and we got a problem. What do they mean by Sabbath? Well, I mean, we've talked about the Sabbath. The, uh, the, the first day of the, the week, we go to Saturday, we get all the way to Saturday, well, technically Friday evening, and you're not supposed to do any um, regular work, and, and you go to the evening of, of Saturday, and so Friday evening to Saturday evening, and that's the day that you commemorate to God, that, that you remember that on the seventh day God rested, and, and, and the focus after the busyness of the week, of all the things going on in the week, it's to refocus yourself on who you are, who God is, and what that dynamic should be. Okay? So, but here's the problem. Some of the Jews, whenever they looked at these feasts and it says, you shall do no ordinary work, they took that to be a Sabbath. When, when 
the scripture said a holy convocation, they stamp poof, Sabbath on that. Now, some of them think that the Feast of First Fruits unto itself is a Sabbath, regardless of what day it falls on. Okay? Others said no, because it's very clear right here that he says, back up in verse 1 and 2, that the Sabbath is this day, the Saturday. It's once a week. And so there was a big discrepancy as to when they would celebrate. Now, they worked things out in a little bit funny way because both parties could agree that the 6th of Savan, that being the third month, yeah, um, that was the day. They celebrated Passover because they were delivered from Egypt. They went across the Red Sea. They marched down into the, the wilderness of Sinai. Um, on the 6th of Saban, 50 days after the crossing, the deliverance, God gave them the law. So what they decided was, predominantly, almost all Jews, they're, they're just like in Christian circles, there are differences in theology. In the Jews, there are differences in theology. But most of them decided that that will be the 50th day, the 6th of Saban. Okay? So already, one verse in, we're in trouble. All right, so then we go on. Um, you, shall, um, you shall count 50 days to the day after the Sabbath, the seventh Sabbath. Uh, then you shall present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord. Mark new grain. Keep that in your brain. There's a rhyme. New grain in your brain. Um, because that, we'll come back to that. You shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be weighed, made of two-tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour, and they shall be baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. There's another thing. You've got two loaves. Stick that in your brain. It's significant. Baked with leaven. Stick it in your brain. It's significant. Verse 18. And you shall present with the bread seven lambs, a year old, without blemish, and one bull from the herd, and two rams. They shall be a burnt offering to the Lord with their grain sacrifice, uh, the grain offering and their drink offerings, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. <clears throat> 19. And you shall offer one male goat for a sin offering and two male lambs a year as a sacrifice of peace offerings. Now I'm going to segue just for a moment here. Do you see all that they had to do to maintain a right relationship with God. The labor-intensive process. Because you bring a burnt offering to please Him. Then you have a sin offering. Okay? To, that, that their blood, the blood of the animal, would cover your sin. But then you also have a peace offering. So that there might be peace between you and God. Okay? That's a lot of animals sacrificed to get us in a right relationship with God. This is part of why Jesus' sacrifice is so significant because his one sacrifice covered all of this. Amen. He was the atoning sacrifice. He was the peace offering. He, he, he did it all. Okay? So keep in mind when you look at these things that all of the obligations that they had to do. Now God put these on them so that they would be aware, so that they would know their need for a better solution. Not so they could get all snooty and go, ha, 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 we got the right ingredients to get a, 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 the right recipe to get a right relationship with God, and all of you guys are hosed. Or whatever the Jewish equivalent is. Okay? <clears throat> Keep that in mind as you read through the Hebrew Bible. All of these things were done to point to their salvation. Okay? So, reading on, verse 20. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. And you shall make a proclamation on the same day. You shall hold a holy convocation. See right there, that's where we kind of, they got tripped up. Well, this is the Sabbath. This is a Sabbath rest. 
So this should be the Sabbath. So we should count from this day. No, 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 no. You go back to verse 1 and 2. That's the Sabbath. Okay? And around and around it goes. <clears throat> um, uh, 21. And you shall make a proclamation on the same day. You shall hold a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. It is a statute forever in all your dwelling places throughout your generations. Okay? See, do not do any ordinary work. Um, 22. Now, this is kind of a, 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 an addendum that's stuck in there. It's one of those things where, where we're going to take a break from the, the process of thought because there's an important thing that needs to be addressed here. And they talk about the, the harvest. And they talk about how you minister to the needs of those that are without, okay? And they say, and when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. So right here we see one of the first um, communal setups for, for, for those in need. Something happens, something bad happens in somebody's life. They're put in a bad situation. They know that there will be a time for them to gather food for their family. God is looking out for those. Uh, we see this same thing in the book of Ruth. Okay, Remember in the book of Ruth, um, her, her mother-in-law tells her to go out to the field that she can glean right out of this. Okay, And it's through that process as she's gleaning that... She comes into contact with Boaz, and one of these days we're going to get in and we're going to do a study in Ruth. There's some fascinating, amazing things in there that, that don't immediately jump out at you because we're not Jewish. Okay? Because we weren't raised with the understanding of, that, of, of the book. So this little caveat is inserted there. Oh, yeah, and on a side note, you got to do this too to take care of my people. Okay, so let's back up. Um, one thing that I didn't touch on last week that I really wanted to touch on is that um, this is one of the three feasts. If you have your Bible, flip open to um, Exodus 23. Just flip back a little bit. I just want to point this out to you real quick because it's important for our story later. Okay. Exodus 23, picking up in verse 14, okay? Three times a year, you shall keep a feast to me. Three times a year. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. As I commanded you, you shall, not eat, um, you shall eat unleavened bread for seven days at the appointed time in the month of Abib, the first month, for in it, for in it you came out of Egypt. Okay, so that's the first feast. None shall appear before me empty-handed. Now, there were also things in place that if you couldn't afford a lamb or a goat, there were other things you could do so that you could make it to the sacrifice, that you could bring an offering before God. So he's not pinning them to the wall. He's, he's giving them opportunities to come in and make right relationship. Okay? So, verse 16, you shall keep the feast of harvest um, of the first fruits of your labor, of what you sow in the field. You shall keep the feast of ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in from the field the fruit of your labor. Three times in the year shall your males appear before the Lord God. Okay, so we have Passover, the feast of unleavened bread, the feast of the harvest, which is what we're looking at right now, Shavuot. And then we have the, uh, um, I just lost a feast of ingathering, which is a fall feast. Three times a year, all the males in Israel were required to come and present themselves first at the tabernacle in Shiloh, Shiloh. And then when the temple was built, they would come up to Jerusalem and, and go to the Temple Mount to make their, their offerings. Okay? Three of the feasts. Now, we've already looked, and there's a lot of feasts. There's a lot more than just three feasts. There's seven alone in, in the scripture in uh, Leviticus 23. And then there's also the Feast of, of Purim from the book of Esther. There's also the Feast of Hanukkah 
uh, that we see uh, Jesus celebrating the Festival of Lights, the Feast of Lights, uh, that we see Jesus celebrating in uh, the Gospels. So there are other feasts, but three times God says, you must come before me. This is one of those three times. Now, I'm going to butcher the name, and Jeannie, you can correct me. Um, Shalash Regalin? That's what the Jews call the three feasts, okay? Or something like that. Um, so, important that we know, this was one of the feasts that they had to come to him at Jerusalem. You're going to go, okay, why do I care? Because right now you're going to turn to Acts chapter 2. Okay? And this is where we start to see the fulfillment. Remember, our premise is we're operating from this standpoint, this foundation, that all of these feasts listed in Leviticus chapter 23, all of them are prophetic. They're pictures painting to God's divine plan for mankind. Okay? We've seen how Christ fulfilled the Passover. We've seen how Christ fulfilled uh, unleavened bread. We've seen how Christ fulfilled the Feast of First Fruits. And now we're going to take a look at what is also part of the First Fruits, but it's the latter First Fruits. Okay? Um, so, Acts chapter 2. Now, I'm warning you right now. I grew up in a Pentecostal church. Amen. <laughs> Nobody ran for the door. I'm going to tell you right now, I went to a Pentecostal college. Now I got real quiet. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now, I believe that in this aspect, the Pentecostal church got it wrong. Got what? Got it wrong. Okay. I do not believe that Scripture clearly indicates that the infilling of the Holy Spirit is a second definitive work of grace as noted by the speaking in tongues. Okay. Now, I see examples of that in Scripture, and I believe it can work that way, but I don't believe that there is a need for a second definitive work of grace because the cross was enough. We didn't need any more than the cross. I mean, the fact that he rose from the dead was like the cherry on the, the topping, right? Because it's like, okay, he said, when I go to the cross, I'm going in your place. When he was at the end, he said, it is finished, done. All the work is done, okay? But then when he rose from the dead, we knew he was speaking the truth, okay? So look at, let's look at Acts chapter 2. So those of you that, knowing that I came from a Pentecostal background, don't freak, Okay? Don't get panicked. Because we're going to be looking at the context of this in light of Shavuot. Alright? So, Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. <clears throat> now notice, it doesn't tell you where they were. Okay? But, we have a good reasoning a good path of logic to indicate probably where they were. I'll touch on that in a moment. Okay? And suddenly, there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it, it, it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Okay? So you go, oh, they were sitting in a house. Mm, hold on. Okay? Just hold on to that. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay? Now, a lot of times, people stop right there. But that's not the rest of the story. That's not where the story ends because we have a verse 5. It says, uh, Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? 
Parthians and Medes, Elamite, the residents, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? Okay, now I'm going to stop there because the, the story doesn't stop there. It continues on. But there's some things we need to look at because the very first thing that Luke tells us at the start of this, because remember, Luke didn't put chapter 2. He, 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 was, he was writing a story, but he wasn't writing a book. He was writing a letter. Okay, So when he ended up uh, and they cast lots for them, uh, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. And then there's a pause because he says, when the day came. Okay, so we, we don't really know from here to here the span of time, but we know that there's when the day came. What, the, what day? Pentecost. Shavuot. Okay, so we know here this is a marker, a, a time reference marker. Because when was Jesus crucified? Come on, we talked about the feast. What day? What, what celebration was, being, was going on? Passover. 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 Peshach. Jesus was sacrificed. He went to the cross when the, the sacrificial lamb was being slaughtered. Okay. And so 50 days from the waving of the Omer, the first fruits, which is when what happened? First fruits. What happened on first fruits? He arose. he arose. He rose from the dead. The firstborn from the dead. He is the first fruits of those over whom death will have no hold. Okay? Because we might go down in the grave for a little while, but that's not really us, is it? Our, our body is part of us, and one day we'll be reunited with it better in every way, but we go immediately into the presence of our Lord, don't we? Okay? So... He is the first fruits from the dead. If he rose from the dead, we can have faith that we will rise from the dead. When that trumpet blows, when that call goes forth, I'm out of here. Okay? And if it happens to be while I still have this flesh, <laughs> those of you that are here, pray fast. Okay? You know? Um, I had a pastor who used to say when he heard that trumpet blow, he was going to grab as many sinners as he could. Give him a choice on the way up. Okay. I don't think you're going to have that much time. All right. But, but Jesus rose. He's the first fruit. So 50 days from the celebration of first fruits. Boom, 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 boom. We believe this to be the 6th of Savon because that's when they were celebrating Pentecost. All right. Now, in today's Christian culture in America, Pentecost has taken on an entirely different meaning, hasn't it? Because when I said Pentecostal, what was the first thing you thought of? Shoot him out of him, day. See my bow tie, tie my bow tie. Okay? No, I don't want to mock the speaking of tongues because I know of two instances where somebody spoke in a language they did not know and the listener interpreted it in their own language and they were both declaring the praises of God. Okay? So I absolutely believe that that gift is in evidence today. I think as with all gifts, there's the propensity to abuse and misuse it. As with all gifts, there were miracle healing shysters long, long ago. Okay? That doesn't diminish the fact that God heals today. God does heal today. Well, I mean, take a look in Vivian's journal at all the answered prayers where God reached down miraculously and healed people. Okay? So this does not diminish, the fact that it is abused does not diminish that it is, it is a gift that God uses to reach people. Okay? So, Pentecost, let's bend our brains to wrap that back to the, the, the Feast of Shavuot, the, the Feast of Weeks. Uh, they were all together in one place. And then it says a little bit later, and it filled the entire house. Now, up until we went to Israel, I always had this kind of thought in my head that that meant they were in the upper room. And then we got to the southern steps of the temple. And our tour guide just made kind of a passing comment about this being where the spirit fell. 
And, and our, our tour guide had so much incredible knowledge in his head that he would pass things off, ex off expecting that we would know them and keep going. And the entire bus would go, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> what did you just say? And so I started looking into this because I believe now, I believe, that when the, the Christian Jews were together, the followers of Christ were together, they are celebrating the feast. They would have been up at the temple. They wouldn't have been hanging out at a house. They would have been up at the temple. Most likely, they were either on the southern steps or in Solomon's colonnade, which was on the southern end of the temple. And when the Spirit fell, they were all in one place. Now, one of the things that I think this says, because we looked at the house with the upper room. There is no way in the world you're going to get 3,000 people in the street outside. It's not going to happen. It's not a place that would be conducive for Peter to preach a sermon and be able to be heard up and down. But you put him at the top of the steps on the southern side of the temple, and all of a sudden, there's a whole lot of room for these things to take place. Okay? So, how weird would it be that this rushing wind comes in and the tongues of fire appeared and rested on them. I mean, you're going up to bring your, your two loaves up, and there's these guys over here, and all of a sudden, whoosh! Okay? You picture it how you want. That's how I picture it. All right. See, you guys are all in trouble, because when that flame floated over my head, everybody saw it because it reflected. <laughs> oh, you guys, you just muted it. All right. So, so the flame comes down, and then they start speaking, and then. But see, you notice the connection here. All of them were speaking something that was interpreted by somebody in the crowd as declaring the praises of God. Okay. So hold on to that. Okay. So let's take a look. Go ahead and bring up um, what was going on the, the slide. <clears throat> okay, go ahead and, and go to the first one. One, they're all gathered in Jerusalem because it's one of the three feasts that all the people were required to go to Jerusalem. Okay, now think about this for a minute. This is 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead. We don't know how many days uh, after he ascended into heaven, but we know from chapter 1 that he told them, wait in Jerusalem until the Spirit comes. Well, timing works such that they're up at the temple to celebrate the feast. The Christians that were saved up to this point and, and shortly thereafter, the Jewish believers never ceased being Jews. Okay? They didn't go, Oh! Oi! I see, I believe, I have faith. I'm not a Jew. I'm a Christian. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. Because what they saw was that who they were, their identity, was confirmed by Jesus Christ. They were fulfilled. They were completed. They were inheritors of that which God promised way back in Genesis chapter 3. And then through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then through David, and, and going on down the line. That, wow! All that he has promised us! Okay? So, keep in mind that when, when you're reading the New Testament, with just a couple exceptions, they're all writing from a Jewish standpoint. Okay? <clears throat> all right. <laughs> Got to run. Next one. <clears throat> so they were all gathered together. They were in one place. I be, oh, by the way, in the house, uh, it's often referenced in Scripture when they would go to the Lord's house. They would gather in the house for prayer. Jesus would teach in the house. All of those could be referring to the temple because it was a common term usage to declare the temple as God's house and to go to the house, capital T, capital H. The house, okay? Not little t, little h, like my house, or my the house, however that works. 
All right. So go ahead and, and go again. Um, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, why? Why were they filled with the Holy Spirit? So they could speak in other tongues? No. What's that? So they, could, they would prophesy? That's a, another gift? Because their heads were on fire? That could be it too. Yes. Do you know why they were filled with the Spirit? Because God was doing a new work in which he was birthing the church. And the only way to get into the church is via baptism of fire, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay, go ahead and go up to the next one. The church was born. The coming of the Spirit was for the purpose of building the church. You cannot be in the church of God, the body of Christ, without being sealed, stamped, marked, by the Spirit of God. Now, I believe, this is my personal belief, we can disagree on this, that's okay, because this is not a make it or break it belief. I believe that at certain times, the Spirit that lives in you will empower you to do something beyond your capabilities. Mm -hmm. But for a purpose other than floating your boat. Okay? The purpose is always to build the church. Whether it be internal to edify and build up the church internally through preaching or teaching. Or to draw believers into the church through evangelism. A word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, a prophecy. All of these things should be for the purpose of building the church. If they fail in that purpose, you have to question what's going on. Okay? Because I see all kinds of things going on where people are rushing for a miracle. Remember when they came to Jesus and they said, yeah, show us a miracle. Give us a goodie. And we heard about that feeding of the 5,000. We saw the dude in the tomb get up and walk out. Show us something real good. I figure being crucified, being buried, and then being raised never to die again, that's about as good as it gets. Okay? So the church was born. Go ahead and go to the next one. New believers receive a new baptism. Now I'm going to hit this for a couple of minutes because there's a couple things I want to point out to you before we wrap this up. Acts chapter 1 verse 5, just one chapter over. Okay? Jesus is speaking. I'm going to I'm going to back up to verse 4 just so you get the context. Uh, it says, and while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Okay, so the start of chapter 2 is the fulfillment of verse 5, chapter 1. Okay, the, the, the Holy Spirit was going to come. But he's coming with a purpose. It's not like, you know, um, one of those little machines that has all the different toys in it and you put the quarter in and you turn it a couple times and you get a random toy. That's not how this works. And if you don't like it, you give it to your sibling and take their quarter and put it in and turn it and turn it and, and hope you get a better one. Okay? That, that's not how this works. The Spirit gives as God wills. Because he has a purpose and he has a plan. Now, you can take and you can use your gifts to other purposes. I have seen people that took incredible gifts that God has given them and have used them for their own selfish purposes. Okay? I believe that God keeps his hand on them because the gifts and the callings are without repentance. But eventually that house of cards is going to fall. I absolutely believe it. Okay? So... Uh, new believers, a uh, new baptism. So it's not the baptism of water, but uh, let's go um, Acts chapter 11. Over a few more pages. Starting down in verse 15. <clears throat> 
Um, actually, I'm going to give you a little background. Um, Peter is, is reporting back to the church in Jerusalem uh, about the things that God had done. Uh, remember, he was um, sitting on the roof at Cornelius' house, and God put him, gave him a vision of the sheet lord from heaven with all sorts of animals, and he said, take and eat. And Peter said, no, I've, I've touched no unclean thing. And God says, uh, call no thing unclean that I have made clean. And this happens three times. And, and then <clears throat> there's a, a man from Joppa sends down and asks for, for Peter to come and, and to um, minister to him. Okay, So he goes and he prays. And um, well, let's, let's look down here. Um, I'm going to start in 13. Uh, and he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house. This is um, the, the man that he was going to speak. Um, it says, uh, send a Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. Okay? And then Peter says, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Okay, then he goes on to, to share his conclusion. He says, if then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? Okay, so basically what he's saying, that this house that he went to was Gentiles. They were not Jews. Okay, thus the purpose of the vision. Okay, because Peter should not have gone into a Gentile's house. It would have been an unclean house. It would have made him unclean. He would have had to have gone and been ritually cleansed. Okay? But he goes to the house, and this man had received a vision. Hey, hey, get Peter up here. He's going to tell you how to get saved. And so Peter comes in. He says, well, okay, I'll tell you what happened. See, we were standing, and wham! The same signs that we read in Acts chapter 2 came on them. Now, I don't know if it was all of them, the rushing wind, the flames of fire, the speaking in other tongues. I don't know if it was some of them. I don't know if it was a combination. I don't know. It doesn't tell us. All that we know is that the, the same thing happened. Okay? And so he's telling the, 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 the Jewish church, the Jewish, the Messianic Jewish church in Jerusalem, hey, look, God's doing the same thing among them when they believe in Jesus Christ. They're receiving the same baptism that we receive. We can't tell them you can't be a part of this. God has already made them a part of this. Okay? This is huge, people. This is huge. Because for the first time in the history of, of the Jewish nation, there is this innate hostility because we're different. We're separate. You guys are profane. We are holy. You guys don't have the law. You don't have the prophets. You don't have the writings. We do. Too bad for you. Okay. So when he comes to the Jews in Jerusalem and he tells them this, okay, Paul writes about this. But first we need to tie this. How does any of this relate to the feast? Other than Acts chapter 2 happened on the day of the feast. It does. Let's go look at a couple things that were significant from the feast. Okay? First, remember the two loaves? Two loaves. Two. Not one. Two. Everything in Scripture is important. Nothing is there randomly. Nothing is there accidentally. Okay? So there were two loaves that were given. Um, Jewish tradition was that they had to be brought to the temple on one tray or one basket. They were two loaves and one thing that were brought to the temple and presented to the priest. Okay? This is a prophetic picture of what God just did in Acts chapter 2 and through to where we read in 11. Okay? Because, whereas before, the, the bread of the unleavened bread was one, now there's two being used for the same purpose. Okay? So let's, let's look at this. Let's see how this works. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Flip over with me real quick. you got to flip quick because we're running out of time. <clears throat> Starting in verse 11. 
Ephesians 2, verse 11. <clears throat> It would help if I was in actually in chapter 2. <clears throat> Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles, Paul is writing to Gentiles, okay? The church at Ephesus was, pre Ephesus was predominantly Gentiles, all right? But listen to what he says. At one time, you Gentiles, now that right there in and of itself coming from a Jewish person could have been a curse, okay? But Paul's not using it as a curse because look what follows. In the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Okay, so he's, he's noting the primary difference between the Jews and the Gentiles. And, and there was a move in the church at this time that, that in order for Gentiles to truly be saved, they had to adhere to the laws of Moses. And that meant snippy snippy for all the males. Okay, so this is why Paul is, is laying this out this way. Verse 12, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Okay, you see the gap there? But now, I, I, but is one of my favorite words in the Bible, because it almost always resolves a problem. Okay? Okay. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one. Both, both, both who? Jews and Gentiles. Two loaves. One for the Jews, one for the Gentiles. And has broken, um, for, uh, who has made both of us one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace. When the church was born, that dividing wall of hostility was going down. You had to. Because remember when God drew Israel out of all the peoples of the earth, when he spoke to Abraham and, and called him and said, go, I will give you this land, it was not for the sole purpose of blessing Abraham. It was such that through Abraham, God would bless the world. Okay? So yeah, absolutely, the Jews have a very dear place in God's heart. And part of that was that he was able to use them to restore to himself the lost. Okay? So we'll go uh, one more passage here just to, to kind of strike the point home. Flip over to chapter 3. Uh, Paul's continuing on in the same vein. Um, starting in verse 4. Uh, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles, holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The mystery, okay, so first there's a mystery that, that people didn't get before, and only now, at the time that Paul is writing, in, in that first generation of Christians, has it been revealed. Okay, this is the mystery. You guys, you're in for something good here. Because there were millions of people before you that never got insight to this mystery. This, this mystery. All right? The mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. If that doesn't get you excited, you're dead. Because, see, what God had promised to the Jews, that there would be a fulfillment whereby all of them would be saved, that he would restore to them a, a promise of peace, of prosperity, of fellowship with the Almighty, we are now grafted into those promises. Christ Jesus made a way that we could be inheritors of those promises. If you don't get that, man, you've got to get on your knees and ask God to show you. 
Why is that so important? Because without this, we would still be lost. We would still be dead in our sins. We would be separated from the mind of Christ, the thoughts, the will, the heart of the Almighty God. We would not have the Spirit that teaches us, that opens our eyes to see truths that without the Spirit we cannot see. Okay? Two loads. Significant, important. One other thing. I told you to mark. Do a, a mark. Um, remember the bread being leavened? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's important too. Because how many loaves were leavened? Two. 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 Both loaves. Both loaves. What does leaven represent? Sin. Sin. See, the way to salvation is the same for both of us, the Jews and the Gentiles, because we're both caught in sin. And only through Jesus Christ, who has removed that barrier, who has removed that wall, can any of us be saved. Okay? So, two loaves, significant. Um, leaven, very significant. But also, what, was, what were the uh, loaves made of? Sorry? Seven lambs. Seven lambs, yes. Well, that's a study for another day. But I will tell you this. Seven is the number of completion. Okay? So it's important. Number of completion. Okay? The wheat that the bread was made of. Jesus, throughout his ministry, used wheat to symbolize the evangelism, the building of the church. Okay? When the church was birthed on Shavuot, it was the fulfillment of the promise that Jesus spoke very roundabout in his parables. Not because he was trying to be devious, but because their minds were not open yet. They hadn't received the Spirit. Now, I need to back up and address one thing about the Spirit here. There were fillings of the Spirit well before Acts chapter 2. Okay? But this is radically different. Whereas the Spirit fell then for a specific purpose to speak the things of God to, to, through prophets, through prophecies, uh, through miracles. Um, here he is given freely as a mark to those who believe. Okay? He is the seal of our salvation. He still empowers to do the things that God needs done. But what we have today is unlike anything that came before it. Okay, So, <clears throat> let's look at a couple things. Uh, Matt, don't turn here. Uh, we can put the scriptures up and you can write them down and look them later. Uh, Matthew 3, 11 through 12. Uh, John is speaking. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, uh, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Wow. Did you catch that? John, who never got to see this, is telling them what's coming on Pentecost. The Holy Spirit and fire. Okay? Um, his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The church, those that belong to Christ, the wheat will be gathered. Those that do not, the chaff, those things that are left over that bore no fruit are cast aside. They're put in the fire. Let's look again. Matthew 13, uh, 24 through 40. Um, he put another parable before them saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them into bundles to be burned but gather the wheat into my barn. There's a couple things going on here. First thing you need to know is we're the wheat. 
Second thing you need to know is that sown amongst us are the weeds. In this world, you're going to be running amongst the weeds. You've got to be aware of the weeds. Okay? But Jesus is also telling us, I'm not pulling them out until the, the, it's time for harvest. You go, oh God, it would be so much better if that person was just gone. Take that out of my life. Don't make me have to deal with this anymore. I'm not taking them away until it's harvest time. You're the wheat. He's the weed. But if you are faithful to what he has given you to do, there is a chance that that wheat can, wheat can miraculously be transformed into wheat. That the full harvest might be brought in. Okay? So... Couple other thoughts. Oh, dang it. All right, we're just going to jump forward here. I'm going to wrap this up. This is the last of the spring feasts. Okay? We've seen that Jesus ministered the fulfillment of each of the prophecies given uh, Passover. He came into Jerusalem on Lamb Selection Day. He was tested and tried to make sure he was perfect for the four days up until Passover. He was sentenced, he was crucified at the same hour as the Paschal Lamb was crucified, and he died in our place. But when he died, he said, it is finished. Okay? The Feast of Passover. The Feast of First Fruits. That's the unleavened bread. No sin. Jesus fulfilled that in that when he went to the cross, he was without blemish. He was without flaw. He was without sin. He was the perfect Paschal Lamb. Okay? He calls himself the bread of life. The sinless bread. Okay? And then we go into... Um, that was, I'm sorry, that was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then we go into the Feast of First Fruits. Okay? First Fruits. Now, keep in mind, some, some scholars put the Feast of First Fruits and... and the Feast of Weeks as, as actually one feast, bookending the, the, the 50 days, the first fruits and then the latter fruits. Um, but we're dealing with them separately. Um, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, he was without sin. The Feast of First Fruits, Jesus was the first fruits from the dead, the first to raise from the dead and not die again. Because there's all throughout Scripture, there are people being raised from the dead. Lazarus was raised from the dead. But he died again. Okay? Jesus was buried, was resurrected. He's never going to die again. And he has promised us that if we die in this life, then look, look. You have faith in Christ. You may die once. But death has no victory over you. The grave has lost its sting. It's lost its power. Because when that trumpet blows, he is going to resurrect those that preceded us <clears throat> it's going to give them new bodies. See, we are body, soul, and spirit. Okay. If God did not intend us to be body, soul, and spirit, he wouldn't resurrect the bodies. God created us to be a tripartite being, body, soul, and spirit. Okay. So when Jesus rose first, it's the first fruits. That's our hope that we too will rise. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the uh, Feast of Weeks, as we just discussed, the birth of the church. Okay. Now, there are three feasts yet to come. Um, I told you last week, I believe that these feasts came so very close together because that was what God's way of showing us that when he moves, it's going to happen quickly. Okay. Because Jesus came, and in the span of 33 years... And really, in, in the span of three and a half years. And, and really, in the span of little more than a week. God answered the prophecies. Okay? Now we're in the church age. And I believe the church age is that, that period of time between the spring feasts and the fall feasts. Okay? And we're going to see the fall feasts answered. Now, uh, somebody made a comment to me that um, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, Jesus met that. Yes, in part. 
in part. We have yet to see the full realization of that in that we still struggle with sin. Okay? There is a day coming when we will not struggle with sin. Sin, sin, which is not our master now because we're under grace, but there will come a point, pray God soon, when we will no longer struggle with sin because it will be wiped away. Okay, So we're going to start next week. We're going to start hitting those fall feasts. And, and see, these are easy because we've seen how they were fulfilled. These ones coming up, we need to mark and be aware of. We watch the time. <coughs> Because those are indicators of when these things are going to happen. Okay? So we want now, um, you're not going to get the date. All right? You're not going to be able to. You, you sit down and you come up with a date to me, and I'll say, yeah, there's a chance. God can choose any date. I imagine if there's enough Christians in the world and we all pick a date, one of them's going to get it right. Okay? But that's not the point, is it? The point is that we live each day expecting that he's coming that day, that we might be busy about the master's work. But we also live each day hoping that there's more time that we can gather the harvest and bring the full harvest in. Amen. Okay? We live in that balance. All right? So, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that, that you've given us insight, that, that, Father, you teach us, you speak to us, that your spirit reveals truth to us. I ask, Father, that as we endeavor to know more, to, to understand more, Father, that you would open our minds to receive, that, Father, you would give us wisdom and knowledge beyond our own abilities, that, Father, we might know you, that we might pursue you, that, Father, we might be even more in step with those things that you desire. We pray these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I got a prayer.